church. Great to see you. Happy Sunday. Wednesday night, we're having a great time going through off-topic off series, and uh, I shared that I had an announcement to make this Sunday. Special announcement Amy and I want to share. Uh, for those of you who don't already know, no, it's not that kind of announcement, baby. It's if you don't already know, or if you've not seen Photographic Proof, we do have a new member of the family. This year, we got a puppy. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Chloe. All right, yes, yes. The cutest yet dumbest dog in the universe. <laughs> Chloe, while adorable, uh, has issues. <laughs> and uh, over the last couple months, we've noticed that she just, ah, just doesn't get it. Like, so we got a trainer, they come to the house, trying to teach her how to you know, heal, stay, come, sit. I'd just be happy if she learned her name and actually showed up and we called her. So I thought, you know what, she needs to be around other dogs. So we had a play date, we got our dogs together. You know how you do play dates with dogs, right? No, just me? Okay, I'm weird. So we brought over Cooper. Cooper, yes, the Barton's dog. We have a picture of, uh, I think, Cooper and uh, Chloe on the left, giving him a proper rude welcome. So we have Chloe on the left, and Cooper, who is twice her size, weighs twice as much, been on the planet twice as long, knows all the moves, very quickly put Chloe in her place. And within seconds, Chloe was flat on her back, learning <laughs> you don't greet your playmates like this. And he's got like a hand on her chest, like, you will submit, you will be, just chill, you don't have to attack, you don't have to be super, hey Dave, can we zoom in on Chloe's expressions? Yes, yes. She's so cuddly now, not so cute, huh? And I was envious, because I was looking at all these dog parks, Apex just opened one this week, and uh, I see like 20 and 30 dogs in these parks, and they're all like off the leash, and they're so obedient. And I think, what went wrong? <laughs> Something went horribly wrong with my Chloe. We haven't given up on her. But then I started thinking about this, knowing that we're going to be talking about listening to the voice of God today. And I thought it was amazing, out of these 20 and 30 dogs playing in the park, the well-trained ones, they recognize their name. The goal is, you should be able to yell the, the name of your dog, and the dog stop. Even if you let your dog off the leash, and they're running free. <laughs> The theory is when they're trained, you're supposed to be able to call their name, and if they're playing, they would literally stop and look at you. Even if there's two or three dogs in the park with the same name, only your dog stops and looks. You know why? This is so good. Because your dog not only knows its name, it knows your voice. In fact, we'll give the invitation, we'll go home. That right there is such a truth grenade. Y'all, when we spend time with the Father, we know his voice. When we spend time in his word, we begin to recognize his will and the Spirit's leading. The more you know his word, the more you will know his will. Write it down, count on it. Ask yourself, when seeking his will, can you eliminate the distractions? Can you truly discern his voice? Sometimes it's not as easy as we'd like it to be, is it? There's so much clutter. There's so much chaos. But let me tell you guys, God is not trying to hide his will from you. God is not capricious. He's not some aloof, distant Gandalf up in the clouds trying to, I know a great plan for your life. I'm just not going to tell you. He doesn't do that. In fact, I've said this for years. He is more desirous of you finding his will and walking in it than you are yourself. That is a huge statement. So God is not trying to hide it, okay? Today we're going to look at part three of Into the Wilderness, listening for God's voice. I hope you've enjoyed this series so far because God has been speaking to me and there is some awesome truth he has for us today. So we've been spending time checking out different stories in scripture, all of which go back to wilderness experiences of some of the great heroes of our faith in scripture. In week one, we saw what it meant to be tested in the wilderness, what it meant to be tempted Jesus himself had his wilderness experience. Okay, so it's not just you. Jesus, the Lord himself, had a wilderness experience. Last week, in week two, we learned the importance to have patience in the wilderness. Because patience gives us perseverance. That persistence. And when we do that, we end up having a proper perspective in the wilderness. And we saw how important it is to see things 
through the right lens. Remember, we shared the Burger King, the full moon, and you zoomed in on that sign. And once you have the right lenses in front of you, it changes everything. We need to see things not as we think they are, but as they truly are. For instance, in my mind, when I go to shop at Walmart, this is how I think I look. <laughs> However, when I get to the self-checkout camera, this is what I really look like. Are you with me? It's all about perspective. It is so important that we see things the way they really are. And when you are in the wilderness, be honest, it is hard to hear the voice of God sometimes because you're so focused on what's going wrong in your life. You're so focused on the pain and the immediacy that we are focused right here, almost like myopia. We're looking right here. It's all we can see. But what if I told you the wilderness doesn't have to be the scary place that we think it is because it can actually be a sacred place where God grows our faith where he stretches us, where we're challenged. So today, we're going to look at the story of Elijah, and we're going to learn what it means to listen in the wilderness. So if you're ready, open your Bible or pull up 1 Kings and just kind of hold your place there. We're going to be in 1 Kings. I'm going to read from the CSB. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us. If you're sick, you're out of town, glad we could connect over the miles. We thank you for being with us. Here's what's happened up to this point. Remember, context is key. Do your level best to resist the easy urge to take scriptures out of context. People are doing it all the time. So here's what's happened up to this point. Elijah has just had a massive victory. He went up on Mount Carmel. You know, the prophets of Baal were there. And they're like, oh, we're going to do a big altar sacrifice, all this stuff. And they got it all wet, right? And Baal never showed up, didn't take the sacrifice. And Elijah said, go wet this altar down. Do it again. Pour more jars of water on it. Get it crazy. Get it super soaked, all right? And then we're going to see which God's real. And Elijah prayed, and God sent down fire, and it consumed not only the sacrifice, but it just absorbed the altar. And it was this incredible victory. And, and Elijah's like, don't let these prophets of Baal escape, right? And they killed them all. And it was this huge, huge victory. Yet the next page over, here in chapter 19, Elijah is suddenly no longer on the mountaintop. He's running for his life, and he's hiding in a cave because of one woman. Queen Jezebel has issued a death threat and says, what you did to them? I'm going to do to you by this time tomorrow. So Elijah freaks out, and he's running into the wilderness. There's that word again. And he's alone in the cave. This is where we pick up the story, starting in verse 9. He says this. He entered a cave there, and he spent the night. Suddenly the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I love this, okay? I just picture Luke Skywalker, whiny voice. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies. But the Israelites, they've abandoned your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone, here it is, right? Woe is me. I am the only one left. And they're looking to take my life. Uncle Owen, this one's got a bad motivator, right? You hear it? You hear the Star Wars, don't you? He's looking at this. And before we get too judgmental, we do the same thing. Be honest. We all get in our little pity parties. Pity party of what? <laughs> Selfish here. We do this. Okay, so he's not any different than we are. Look at verse 11. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. At that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains. It was shattering cliffs before, y'all, that is power. It was shattering cliffs before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is such a cool story. So unique. It's so important to understand that the way God spoke to Elijah is not always the way he speaks to people. But he can See, here's the hard truth about God speaking to us. We often don't hear his voice as clearly as we hear the lesser voices. Know what I'm talking about? We often don't hear his voice because we're so overwhelmed with other voices. So our first truth for us today is this. We must learn to discern. This is so key. Do you want to have direction in your life? Do you want to have clarity about that job situation, that person you're thinking about spending the rest of your life with? We have to learn how to discern between the voices that are junk and godly voices. 
See, the good shepherd is the voice we're supposed to hear, right? Over the, the roar of the crowd. This is like what we talked about with the dogs. The master could say a word and the dog heard it and knew it because he recognized his voice. This is where we learn discernment. If you were here last week, we talked about David and how he had to have patience when it came to waiting to taking the throne, even though he'd been anointed as king. We looked at how he had patience, and we came to that conclusion. It's because of his time spent with God that he was able to persevere, that he was able to have this incredible perspective and walk with God on a deeper level. That is how he was able to persevere in patience, because he had this, a close relationship with the Father. So you know i got to ask, do you? Maybe that's one reason we're not hearing his voice clearly. Because if we're honest, we're kind of doing this to our Father. Right? I'll, 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 I'll be with you in a minute, Lord. <laughs> you know, we keep him at arm's length. I believe when it comes to discerning God's voice, we have to have that closeness with God as well. But before we can even talk how to discern God's voice, I want us to understand what discernment means. Because we've got a lot of young people here today. It's a big word. We don't hear it anymore. Here's one dictionary's definition of discernment. Discernment is the ability to obtain sharp perceptions or to judge, oh, there's that word, that's not nice, pastor, we don't judge, okay, with the goal of obtaining and maintaining spiritual guidance and understanding, all right? So right there, we see discernment is separating things. Did you catch that? Separating good things from bad things. We're allowed to do that. We're supposed to have discernment. Godly people are supposed to be able to recognize his voice and the voice of the enemy. See, in John 10, Jesus says himself, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. My sheep know my voice, and they listen, and I know them, and they follow me. Right? Just like we saw in the dog illustration. The goal for Elijah way back in the wilderness is no different than the goal we have today. Every one of us wants guidance. When I think of guidance, I immediately am taken to a particular movie. Okay? Just a movie. I don't talk about it much, but when I put up a picture, I want you to shout out what this is. Can you, anybody know what this is? The Death Star. The Death Star. All right. Now, for the real nerdy nerds, what is this? Star Short. That go, no, no, no. Hang on. Easy trigger. Easy. We'll get there. What is this that goes around? There's a band that goes around the Death Star. Anybody know? The Trench, right? This is kind of a big deal. All right, Luke Skywalker flies down this trench. I think we have a photo of this, where he is going to drop a photon torpedo, I think, into this one weakness of this Death Star to blow it up. All right, spoiler alert. <laughs> I hope you've seen the movie, because it's been 40 years, if not. All right, so I held off as long as I could. And don't come up to me after church and be like, Pastor, we were going to see it tonight. I can't believe it. We are going to go by Blockbuster and get the VHS. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. It's kind of a big deal. It's the whole plot. He's got to blow up the Death Star, and he's got to fly down this trench. To do it, he has what's called a targeting computer, or better yet, a guidance computer. Some of you are wondering where this was going. He has a guidance computer. He trusts in the technology, and he's got it lasered right in front of him, and he, and he sees these red beams that are getting closer and closer on his computer, telling him the amount of feet he has left before he's got to drop that bomb. And it's coming, and it's faster, and it's faster, and like, people are fighting all around him. He's like, just keep him, just give me a few more minutes, I'm almost there. And then, just when you think he's got it made, he hears a still, small voice. The voice of Obi-Wan, that's right. Let go, Luke. Use the force, Luke. Trust your instincts. And Luke kind of looks around like, what is that? And he waves it off. Oh boy, this is getting spiritual. He waves it off, and he leans in even more, and he accelerates, and he's coming up close. Then he hears the voice again, Luke, let go. Trust your instincts. Use the force. Right? We hear this famous thing. And he does. He lets, he literally hits the cancel button. The guidance computer comes up and goes behind him, and the people in the command ship start freaking out. The good guys who are monitoring him, he was the last hope, go, Luke, you switched off your guidance computer. What's wrong? What's wrong? And he's like, nothing's wrong. He made a choice to listen to a voice. Guys, can I share something? We don't have to use the force <laughs> when you have the real Holy Spirit. Not only that, we have his living word that speaks to us. This is what we've been talking about the past two weeks, the importance of being in his word. Anytime we need guidance, anytime you're being tested, when you're in the wilderness, run back to his word. We can't afford to be ignorant of what God says anymore. 
Guys, we have entire generations growing up that have zero knowledge of the Word of God. Zero. It's not their fault. Kids can't drive themselves to youth groups. Kids can't take themselves to conferences. Kids, parents do that. Grandparents do that. They take leadership. They get the, y'all, it used to be, we were talking about this, Pastor Bill and Pastor Jason, we were in staff meeting. It used to be that pastors would have a seven-year cycle of key doctrines and scriptures that they would preach through for the church. They go through Revelation, they go through eschatology, then they do apologetics and why are you here and purpose and finances and stewardship. And you would hit all these key major doctrines over the course of maybe seven or eight years. Then they, people are not sticking around, people are dropping out of church, people are leaving, they're abandoning their faith. You better condense that to five years. So if you stayed five years, you would hear these key doctrines. You'd be like, oh, okay, we're back to this. Then they said, dude, you better hit the key doctrines every three years. You better start hitting these over and over again. I was talking to, to a, a good friend today, one of our leaders, a senior adult, said, every three years? Man, you need to do this every three months. I forget it all. And I get that. We're so distracted. Guys, there's whole generations that are not studying the word. How can we expect them to be making wise, discerning decisions when they can't hear the voice of the Savior? And if we aren't leading by example, if this is the only meal we eat and we get in our car, we throw our Bible on the back of the shelf and we just kind of cruise all week, man, if this is your only time you're eating, you are starving. Starving. God is calling us deeper. Not, can, we, can we just be bold here? It is not the will of God if it goes against the word of God. Period. That's it. End, end of story. We have to know his word because so many times this is how God speaks. But sometimes... He'll speak through key people in your life. He'll speak through people around you. He'll choose to speak to someone. And man, when we get the fellowship, that's why it's so important. It's so powerful. Community gathering is so transformative. But you better be discerning of what you allow in your inner circle. This is one of the times you're allowed to be choosy. In fact, let me just stop here and ask, okay? Don't answer out loud. Are the things you are reading, are the people you are listening to, especially friends that you allow in your inner circle. Are they in alignment with God's word? We've known that since childhood. What you feed is what you become. The more we read and understand God knows towards worldly things, things that could even be destructive. See, once we discern God's voice, there's another step. The goal now is to actually listen and obey what God has to say to us. In order for us to listen, when I look at the story, I, I see two requirements on our part. Okay? The first one is this. We must be receptive. That's the very first point. We must be receptive. We have to be good listeners. I love walking down the halls during the week because there's kids up and down. It's like 40 kids up here every day now. And they're screaming, they're laughing, and the teachers will be like, oh, Pastor Matt, I'm so sorry they're loud. I'm like, no, don't apologize. I love it. If it's a holiday and they're closed, I'm sad. I don't hear the life. I don't hear the laughter. I don't hear the crying. I don't hear all that stuff. But they have this little trick to get them quiet. I'll say, little owls, little owls, put your listening ears on, right? Or little llamas, teachers talking, eyes on me, eyes on me. Or they do this, and all the kids do it back, right? Can you do it? All right. Okay, all right, good. See, isn't that fun? You're listening. But have you ever had a time when you're talking to somebody, and you're looking in their eyes, you're sharing like a heartfelt story, like you, you or a victory, and you look in their eyes, and you can tell they're not really listening. Yeah, I could do it right now to some of you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you look in their eyes, and you think, they're not listening. Isn't it annoying? You just want to, like, box them in the nose and go, pay attention. Right? Like, I, you're, not, you're not listening. I saw the most incredible T-shirt. So funny. It absolutely nails this. It says this. My wife says I only have two faults. I don't listen, and something else. I don't, know. I don't remember what it is. But it's, <laughs> If you're honest, maybe this is you. Or maybe it's somebody you know. And you think, you know what? I wonder if I have the tendency to do the same thing to the Lord. Like we say we're listening. Right? God, I need you to speak to me. I, I have such a, 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 I'm at a crossroads. I got a big decision to make. And you've got seven seconds before I got to go to the next meeting and answer. Right? We, we grin because we've been there. God, I really need it. I got to hear from you. I got to hear from you. I'm going to kneel for at least eight seconds and let you. 
Didn't get it. Okay. God failed again. <laughs> Y'all, this is, this, we are so preoccupied by so many things. We're in such a hurry, in such a rush, that we don't put our priorities where we say they are. We're so pulled here and there, and simply we can't hear God's voice because we're being so distracted and encumbered and weighed down. Hebrews 12.1 says this, throw off everything that hinders you. Throw off everything because God knows there are certain things that are going to keep us from pursuing him with our whole heart. Things that will slow us down like you're going through a bog and you've got chains on you and you can't quite make it. And he says, throw that off. Come on, spiritual Christian. Man up. Grow up. Dudes, put your purse down, park your Prius, and let's do this. Let's go. For the love of donuts, the world is watching. Are we serious about what we say? See, when I look at this in Elijah, part of learning how to listen to God and receive his voice was learning where, what, and who he was going to speak through. Because it was crazy. God would speak here. Remember, there was a roaring fire he could have spoken through, but he didn't. There was this huge earthquake that he could have spoken through, but it wasn't that. There was this roaring fire and this rushing wind in the whisper. By receiving, being receptive to hearing God's voice anytime, anywhere, we open ourselves up to him doing something that you didn't expect. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a true story. I just read this week of a missionary pilot named Forrest Zander. Great book about it. He writes about landing on a remote airstrip in the middle of nowhere. When he landed, it was on a different continent. He said the runway was so bad, so pitted, storms had come through, and now it was nothing but mud. So he's landing in a Cessna. He's got aid that desperately has to uh, reach these tribes and other missionaries. So he's landing for what was supposed to be a quick drop-off. And he lands the plane. He says he is horrified that his plane almost jerks to a stop and the wheels sink into the mud up to its axles. Well, that wasn't scary enough, but the fact was he had to hurry up and unload and get to the next stop immediately, but there was no way he was going anywhere. It was, there's just no way, not humanly. He's sitting there. He's looking outside. Said it says, he's at the end of the runway. He didn't even get far. And he's thinking, what do we do? He's by himself, and he says, you know what? I have no choice but to try to go. How in the world am I going to get airborne and up to speed in this mud? The runway was already short. So he says he got back in the Cessna. He has his hand on the throttle. You ready for this? And he says, I'm going to talk to the Lord, and I'm going to wait. And he bows his head right there in his plane, and he says this, Lord, please help us. I need to hear from you. You have to come through. Please provide the way out of this. Let me hear from you. No sooner had he lifted his head from prayer, he looked up and above the trees, he saw racing towards him a massive black storm cloud that wasn't there just minutes ago. And as he's staring at it, he says it looks as if it is barreling just towards him, like this one little thing. And there's no rain in this cloud, just darkness and wind. He knew there was wind because as he was sitting there with his hand on the throttle, he felt the plane begin to lift because the wind was already generating lift under the wings. And he feels it lift, and a voice inside him says, Go! <laughs> Go already! And he floors the throttle all the way forward. His plane lifts above the mud, and he's skimming along the thing, and he takes off, and he clears the trees, and he is able to go and deliver aid. Guys, think about this. This is what God does. He can use anything if we are receptive to it, if we pause and listen, if we are discerning, even a storm. Like this missionary, when it came to receive God's voice to lead his life, Elijah found God in a place he was unexpected, in a strange place. Look at verse 11 again. Then he says, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence, Elijah. At that moment, the Lord passed by. We see this. A great and mighty wind was destroying the mountain, shattering rocks. The Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. Where are you, God? And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. Man, talk about unexpected. Who would have expected that? Be honest. When we want to hear from God, we want the thundering voice. We want it written in the neon sky. We want it to be overwhelming. This is my will. Walk ye in it. Right? But here... It was a soft whisper. That's it. It was a soft whisper. 
Would you recognize it? Let me ask you a question. What if, be honest, what if you haven't heard God's voice lately because you have been searching for it in all the wrong places? Secular reasoning, wisdom from friends who don't really know the Lord, pop psychology, Dr. Phil, <laughs> take your pick. Maybe the things that are hindering and distracting us are blocking us from receiving the voice of the Lord. Maybe the solution is as simple as doing for the Lord what you do for everybody else. Maybe you schedule time and you protect it like an appointment with your doctor or a date night with your spouse. See, we do that for everything else, but sometimes we let God be the last thing. We do this for every other appointment. One of the most important lessons we learned during our time in the wilderness is this. When everything else is gone, then you are most ready to receive. Let me show you what I mean. Think about it. And you look up and you think, that is unbelievable. It's breathtaking. How come I never saw this before? You know why? Because you got away. There's no more light pollution. You're not able to see it. Back when we were in the city, we look up, I can count, it's like 11 stars. That's it. I thought that's all we had. And then you go away, like, did these stars magically appear? No. They have been there all along. What changed? You got away from the distractions. You got away from the noise and all the pollution. And that leads us to our next truth. Sometimes you have to unplug in order to connect. This is not easy, especially for the younglings. Man, we walk around, we're so connected. We're at the hip. It's like, it's like those contacts. When I text you and you guys don't text me back for 17 hours, I know you got your phone on you. Don't act like you don't. Guys, we got to unplug. We'll never hear God's voice clearly if we're constantly listening to every other voice. Another thing Elijah teaches us, a key factor to listening well in the wilderness, you're not going to like this one. We have to respond. See, this is our part. We must respond. Not only must we be receptive, we have to respond. It is so interesting what Elijah does here in response to hearing the Lord's voice. He hears that still quiet whisper, right? And then in verse 13, look, see if you can spot, spot what he does. It's very simple. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. Okay, so there's an act of submission, humility. He walks out and he stands at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, the voice comes to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Did you catch it? Did you see it? It's so to listen well in this instance. God is requiring of Elijah some step of faith, some action. He needed to move from where he was, which was in the cave, which was safe and comfortable. Oh, get ready. To a place that was no longer safe and a little uncomfortable outside the cave. See, outside the cave, you can get hurt. Outside the cave, you can catch a virus. Outside the cave, you can run into people, and people are icky. I don't like people. It's too peopley out here in this world. Everybody's short-tempered. My drive through line takes an hour. It's ridiculous. I'm just going to go home in my cave where it's safe and comfortable. Right? It's easy to do. That is my nature to turn inward, right? To be an introvert. But that's not what God was calling Elijah to do here. He said, Go. I need you to take action. Go forward. In fact, God doesn't just stop there and say, stop at the cave. You ready for this? This is going to spank some of us. He tells Elijah, I want you to go all the way back to where you were. Ooh, risking his life. Going back. Are you kidding? Jezebel's that way. I made people mad, man. I butchered those Baal prophets. You're looking for me. And God's like, would you just be obedient? I will save you. I will trust you. Do you believe I hold the days of your life in my hand? Or do you not? Because your actions will give your answer. See, there's going to be seasons when God is going to call us from your current place of comfort to an uncomfortable place. Elijah was obedient. Are you? Am I? When God calls us, to, are you willing to obey? See, we say we trust in God. Do we have the faith that God, if he calls you, he'll provide? Do we have the faith that if God calls you to do something, he will go with you on the journey? It's a lot easier to trust God when you have 
a closeness with God. If you don't have that, this is tough. Man, this is real Christianity, Pastor. I don't like this. Let's go back and talk about love of God or something. This is the love of God. The God who says, when you walk with me, I will whisper truths to you. I will speak with you. I will commune with you as friend with friend. All right, so think about your circle of friends. Do you have 80 close friends or family members or coworkers or mentors that you know you can trust because they have this relationship with the creator? Did anyone just pop in your mind? Do you have any friends like that? Do you have any coworkers or family members, a mentor, somebody you can trust that you can go with with your questions and maybe God will speak through them because he, they know God's word? I asked my kids this. I was asking, the, and I said, guys, do you guys have any, you know, is there somebody, not, not me, not somebody, but I'm just curious. Without missing a beat, Maren spoke up, and she works at our Potter's Head Preschool, and she says, oh, you mean like Ruthie? And I said, oh, yeah, like Ruthie. Then she went on. She said, you know, when I think about it, she always has wisdom to offer from the scriptures. Maren said she would never steer you wrong. She would give you the shoes off your feet if you needed them. In fact, she said this, if you needed money and Ruthie didn't have it, I bet she would go out and take a loan in her name and give you the money. That's how faithful a friend she is. It's pretty cool. By the way, Ruthie, you're probably going to have about 150 new friends today, best friends, if you're willing to do that. She trusts Ruthie's opinion because Ruthie knows the scriptures. Can you trust God like that? One of the beautiful things about gathering here every week when we come together for worship is the intentional time and the intentional space we create to allow God to speak. When that 1030 mark hits and our phenomenal worship band takes the platform, we have a chance to allow them to speak. It's not the warm up before the sermon. They're not paving God's holy runway so his jumbo jet can land during the sermon. That's the main event. It's worship. When we come in late, we shortchange God. He can speak through that. He can speak through the word. He can speak through the song, spoken word, sung word. He can speak through testimonies or koinonia when you're rubbing shoulders with people here and you're hearing testimonies. Because this is a safe place. This is a place where you can come, hopefully free from distractions. Hopefully we can tune in together and receive from God. The book of Hosea, God says something incredibly powerful, something so beautiful and really kind of strange in the modern language. He's talking about the wilderness through his prophet. And he says this, therefore, this is God speaking, therefore, I am now going to allure her to the wilderness. You know what allure means? It means to strongly draw. Okay? So God says, therefore, I am going to strongly draw her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. Isn't that great? Aren't you glad that God's not always the boisterous lightning God that's going to throw things down like Zeus and kill you when you step out of line? But here he says, I will speak tenderly to her. I love that picture. Some of you are in the wilderness right now. I can see it in your eyes. I've heard your testimony. We've talked about it. Maybe you've counseled with me in my office about it. Some of you are in the wilderness right now. Let me encourage you. You don't have to fear the wilderness. What can appear to be a scary place can be a sacred place. God can speak to us. He has our attention more when we're in the wilderness. Remember, there's no distractions there. I look at this and I wonder, God, is the reason I'm not hearing you speak tenderly to me is because I'm not being still? I'm not listening. I give you a time limit. You got to speak to me right here or I'm gone. You know, we're so distracted. We're so weighed down by chaos. I wonder, is it any wonder why we don't hear his voice and we don't receive from him? See, this was the case with Hosea. God drew to the wilderness and spoke tenderly. It's the same case for Elijah. In the wilderness, he spoke tenderly. It's the same for us as well. If you're in the wilderness, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you right now. Right where you are, would you just bow your head? Close your eyes. We're not looking around. We're just going to focus 
these next few minutes. God, in these, in these quiet moments, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us. Holy Spirit, you have permission to do what only you can do. You have free reign. We surrender. We sang about it. We do surrender all, Lord. Help us, bring us to the place where we hold nothing back. Speak to us. During these next few moments, Lord, when we sing, when we kneel, we wait for you. We wait for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Last year, I, I heard a story about Joseph Oldendorf. Some of you may have seen this on the news. He was running in the wilderness. He was at Olympic National Forest Park in Washington. And uh, he had a bad, bad fall. It was sub-zero, sub-freezing temperatures. He saw a patch of ice. And before he had time to brace himself, his right leg hit it. I'll spare you the details, but it was bad. Only problem was he was miles into the wilderness. And he laid there in pain, and he's thinking, this would be the time when I pull out my cell phone and I call 911. <laughs> Only problem was, way out in the wilderness, there was no coverage, no signal at all. So he put his phone down, and he said he crawled for the next seven hours. In sub-freezing, his knees were destroyed. His hands were bloody by the time he reached a clearing. He finally got to this place. He would find out that he would crawl over five miles on his hands and knees. And he found a spot where his phone finally picked up a weak signal, and he was able to call 911. He was hiking during the daylight. Now it was midnight. He finally got a signal out, called 911, and it would be another four hours before the rescuers would find him. Another 30 minutes to get him to a clearing that they could medevac and airlift him out. So it's 4.30 in the morning. He's finally getting medical help. He's able to get out of the wilderness, and the story ends happy. He survives this wilderness ordeal. Church, there is never a wilderness so deep that you don't hear God's voice. And there's never a wilderness so deep that he won't speak, that he can't hear you. Ephesians says this, for through him, through Jesus, we have access to the Father. Because of him, we have boldness, we have access, confidence through faith in him. Guys, what a promise. What a full access to the Father. What other faith even pretends to have that? Even in the wilderness, God is immediately accessible. We can listen, we can respond to his voice. Think about this. You have instant communication with heaven. If you just stop, protect that time as a disciple and say, God, I don't want to move until you speak. That's the kind of tenacity we got to have. Like the lady who said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, that's all I need. She had that faith. He's like, who touched me? We give up so easy on our waiting on God. And then we scratch our head and think, well, God's far away. He doesn't really listen. God doesn't answer prayer. And that's a lie from the enemy. We see him answer prayers. Just like Elijah, our goal is to be receptive to his voice, but it's also to respond. So I want to ask, what's your response today? Everything's driving at this moment. What is your response today? It doesn't have to be flamboyant. You don't have to come and wail on the steps. Be right where you are. If you're new here, you're visiting for the first time, I see a lot of faces. I know last week they, they told me they had to add three rows of chairs just to get some of these new families. That's fantastic. If you're new here, we're not weird. All we like to do is finish with a song of worship. And you can make that an altar right where you are. You can kneel there. You can pray. You can come to the altar and pray. No one will bother you. You may just want to stand and worship God in silence. Tell him how good he is. Thank him for his presence. Point is, God has something for you to respond to. Maybe you want to pray for a lost family member or a neighbor. Don't give up on them. We're praying for some. We're praying for some that live right next to us. It's so easy to give. Don't give up. Don't give up. God is here. He has spoken. What's your decision? Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. If you want to sing the song, you can. If you want to come and pray, the altar is open. Just be obedient to his voice and respond as he leads this morning.